This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Brown. The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine, Part First, Section Thirteen. But this, immense as it is, is only one system of worlds. Beyond this, at a vast distance into space, far beyond all power of calculation, are the stars called the fixed stars. They are called fixed because they have no revolutionary motion, as the six worlds or planets have that I have been describing. Those fixed stars continue always at the same distance from each other, and always in the same place as the Sun does in the center of our system. The probability, therefore, is that each of these fixed stars is also a Sun, round which another system of worlds, or planets, though too remote for us to discover, performs its revolutions, as our system of worlds does round our central Sun. By this easy progression of ideas, the immensity of space will appear to us to be filled with systems of worlds, and that no part of space lies at waste, any more than any part of the globe of earth and water is left unoccupied. Having thus endeavored to convey, in a familiar and easy manner, some idea of the structure of the universe, I return to explain what I before alluded to, namely, the great benefits arising to man in consequence of the Creator having made a plurality of worlds, such as our system is, consisting of a central sun and six worlds, besides satellites, in preference to that of creating one world only of a vast extent. It is an idea I have never lost sight of, that all our knowledge of science is derived from the revolutions exhibited to our eye and from thence to our understanding which those several planets or worlds of which our system is composed make in their circuit round the sun had then the quantity of matter which these six worlds contain been blended into one solitary globe the consequence to us would have been that either no revolutionary motion would have existed or not a sufficiency of it to give to us the idea and the knowledge of science we now have. And it is from the sciences that all the mechanical arts that contribute so much to our earthly felicity and comfort are derived. As, therefore, the Creator made nothing in vain, so also must it be believed that He organized the structure of the universe in the most advantageous manner for the benefit of man. And as we see, and from experience feel, the benefits we derive from the structure of the universe formed as it is, which benefits we should not have had the opportunity of enjoying, if the structure, so far as relates to our system, had been a solitary globe, we can discover at least one reason why a plurality of worlds has been made, and that reason calls forth the devotional gratitude of man, as well as his admiration. But it is not to us, the inhabitants of this globe, only that the benefits arising from a plurality of worlds are limited. The inhabitants of each of the worlds of which our system is composed enjoy the same opportunities of knowledge as we do. They behold the revolutionary motions of our earth as we behold theirs. All the planets revolve inside of each other, and, therefore, the same universal school of science presents itself to all. Neither does the knowledge stop here. The system of worlds next to us exhibits, in its revolutions, the same principles and school of science to the inhabitants of their system as our system does to us, and in like manner throughout the immensity of space. Our ideas, not only of the almightiness of the Creator, 
but of his wisdom and his beneficence become enlarged in proportion as we contemplate the extent and the structure of the universe the solitary idea of a solitary world rolling or at rest in the immense ocean of space gives place to the cheerful idea of a society of worlds so happily contrived as to administer even by their motion instruction to man we see our own earth filled with abundance but we forget to consider how much of that abundance is owing to the scientific knowledge the vast machinery of the universe has unfolded but in the midst of those reflections what are we to think of the christian system of faith that forms itself upon the idea of only one world and that of no greater extent as is before shown than twenty five thousand miles an extent which a man walking at the rate of three miles an hour for twelve hours in the day could he keep on in a circular direction would walk entirely round in less than two years alas what is this to the mighty ocean of space and the almighty power of the creator from whence then could arise the solitary and strange conceit that the almighty who had millions of worlds equally dependent on his protection should quit the care of all the rest and come to die in our world because they say one man and one woman had eaten an apple and on the other hand are we to suppose that every world in the boundless creation had an eve an apple a serpent and a redeemer in this case the person who is irreverently called the son of god and sometimes god himself would have nothing else to do than to travel from world to world in an endless succession of deaths with scarcely a momentary interval of life it has been by rejecting the evidence that the word or works of god in the creation afford to our senses and the action of our reason upon that evidence that so many wild and whimsical systems of faith and of religion have been fabricated and set up there may be many systems of religion that so far from being morally bad are in many respects morally good but there can be but one that is true and that one necessarily must as it ever will be in all things consistent with the ever existing word of god that we behold in his works but such is the strange construction of the christian system of faith that every evidence the heavens afford to man either directly contradicts it or renders it absurd it is possible to believe and i always feel pleasure in encouraging myself to believe it that there have been men in the world who persuade themselves that what is called a pious fraud might at least under particular circumstances be productive of some good but the fraud being once established could not afterward be explained for it is with a pious fraud as with a bad action it begets a calamitous necessity of going on the persons who first preached the christian system of faith and in some measure combined it with the morality preached by jesus christ might persuade themselves that it was better than the heathen mythology that then prevailed from the first preachers the fraud went on to the second and to the third till the idea of its being a pious fraud became lost in the belief of its being true and that belief became again encouraged by the interests of those who made a livelihood by preaching it but though such a belief might by such means be rendered almost generally among the laity it is next to impossible to account for the continual persecution carried on by the church for several hundred years against the sciences and against the professors of science if the church had not some record or tradition that it was originally no other than a pious fraud 
or did not foresee that it could not be maintained against the evidence that the structure of the universe afforded. Having thus shown the irreconcilable inconsistencies between the real Word of God existing in the universe and that which is called the Word of God, as shown to us in a printed book that any man might make, I proceed to speak of the three principal means that have been employed in all ages, and perhaps in all countries, to impose upon mankind. Those three means are mystery, miracle, and prophecy. The two first are incompatible with true religion, and the third ought always to be suspected. With respect to mystery, everything we behold is, in one sense, a mystery to us. Our existence is a mystery. The whole vegetable world is a mystery. We cannot account how it is that an acorn, when put into the ground, is made to develop itself and become an oak. We know not how it is that the seed we sow unfolds and multiplies itself and returns to us such an abundant interest for so small a capital. The fact, however, as distinct from the operating cause, is not a mystery, because we see it, and we know also the means we are to use, which is no other than putting the seed into the ground. We know, therefore, as much as is necessary for us to know, and that part of the operation that we do not know, and which, if we did, we could not perform, the Creator takes upon Himself and performs it for us. We are, therefore, better off than if we had been let into the secret, and left to do it for ourselves. But though every created thing is, in this sense, a mystery, the word mystery cannot be applied to moral truth any more than obscurity can be applied to light. The God in whom we believe is a God of moral truth, and not a God of mystery or obscurity. Mystery is the antagonist of truth. It is a fog of human invention that obscures truth and represents it in distortion. Truth never envelops itself in mystery, and the mystery in which it is at any time enveloped is the work of its antagonist and never of itself. End of part 13